I welcome you uh, fellows and friends to our fellowship weekend four. This is the National Fellowship Certificate for Mediators in Kenya, a program that is ongoing to support uh, mediators to be able to be inspired, empowered, and supported through their uh, mediation uh, career, which is what the, that most of the mediators are actually developing as um, right now. So the fellowship program is running from the, uh, from the month of July to November. Um, it is hosted by Wasiliana Hub and uh, it is uh, uh, in, in partnership with the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, American Spaces, uh, Moi Kenya, and also Mediate BC. And also we have a great pool of coaches and those are some of that you'll be experiencing today who are from different organizations who are also supporting us through the fellowship. The fellowship is designed around three key areas. One is wellness coaching. Two is practice uh, development coaching, and then three is the core focus of the program, and that is on uh, conflict uh, transformation coaching. This program is run by the program on conflict transformation. With that, we will be able to start with the words of the Kenyan national anthem, Wimbo wa Taifa kwa Luga ya Kiswahili, and we will have the first stanza, E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, Haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. That is our prayer for our country Kenya and also it is the prayer for the whole world that the world may have peace and that is who we have here with us as mediators, peacemakers. So today is on the 16th day of uh, October in the year 2021. This is our 10 a.m. session to 12 noon session. It is a session that is broken down into parts. The first segment is the wellness coaching and today's uh, session as the fourth month of the fellowship is on emotional wellness with our fellowship coach, Maina Azimio, who is from the, who is a wellness uh, trainer and, and also at the same time, he is very keen on mediators being able to integrate wellness as part of their lifestyle. We will also be having as our second uh, coach for today in the second half after uh, we have taken a short break, we will have our fellowship co-director uh, coaching us today and that is Dr. Sharon Sutherland who is from Mediate BC. And we thank you Dr. Sharon Sutherland because it is exactly midnight her time. And with that, Allow me to please invite Coach Maina Azimio to be able to take us through the first part of the fellowship session. Coach Maina Azimio, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Coach, uh, mediator, mediator Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning everyone. It's, a, it's another pleasure uh, to join you again in this uh, fellowship. We look into how we can enrich the mediation transformation. We talk about transforming conflict from problems to enriching human relationships. How do we do this? Uh, my name is Coach Maina Azimio. For the new people who have uh, joined us for the first time, or just to remind those who have been with us, I am first and foremost, I am a coach, and also I am a mediator. In mediation, I focus on uh, commercial disputes. From my background in entrepreneurship, in business as a business consultant, I have learned a lot in this space. And what I do is uh, I help people to resolve conflicts around property. And I mediate in many other areas where families have disputes, business owners have disputes, and as well as I coach them so that they can get into a better living condition. We have covered quite a bit of our courses. We started with a physical health wellness. That was in July. Then in August, we came to we came to health no, mental wellness. 
then we came to financial wellness last month. And now where we are, we are now talking about emotional wellness. Emotional wellness is the big deal. It is everything. So we'll be talking about how emotions affect our health, how it affect our minds, and how it affects our ability to mediate. So how do we mediate in a situation where people are in conflict? We'll be seeing how conflicts are emotional, are affected by emotions. So when we were talking about physical health, we said that our health is the physiological, the psychological, and sociological well-being. The sociological part is where emotions comes in. And today, I'll only focus on this sociological, where emotions are the key. They are the drivers. They are the fuel. They are the mother of all the other pillars of wellness. Welcome. Let's get into it so that you can be able to run. So Wangare, you'll keep for me my, the time uh, so that I can be able to get into the flow. Okay. We, thank, thank you, Coach Maina. Coach Maina, if I may. Um, yes, so we, it is uh, 25 minutes past 10. And so that means we go until uh, 55 minutes to 11. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank and, you. And, 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 so thank you. Well, uh, first and foremost, is uh, because we're talking of emotional wellness, what is wellness? It's good to remind us what we define wellness to be. Wellness is a process of running about, of learning about and engaging in behaviors that are likely to lead to optimal health. If, if it is applied in the right way and consistently. So if you're not doing it the right way, if not consistent, you'll not get to that state of wellness. And you have heard that uh, wellness leads to optimal health. So what is health? Next thing is health because it's a keyword here. So you can see health has got 10 pillars, clean air, clean water, clean food and supplements where need be. Don't just take fast supplements without knowing which ones you need, your body needs an obstructed energy flow. Quality sleep, sleep is very important. If you don't sleep well, you are not going to be able to get optimal health. Exercise, you have to move your body for many reasons. We have covered some of them, but much more need to be covered. Balanced hormones. How does your body release hormones? How do you react with hormones? So strong immune function, you know, if your body does not have a strong immunity, you will not be able to get into optimal health. The gut, because our energy fuel come from food. So the gut has to be operating very well for you to get there. And then the last one, emotional and spiritual well-being. Let's, let's dive into the, the deal now, because emotional is the last. And that's why I put in this one as the last uh, pillar of wellness. So happiness, what are the pillars of emotions? It is not selfish to love yourself, take care of yourself, and to make happiness your priority. It is necessary. For a fact, uh, mediators, we are always thinking about other people when they are having problems. They are in conflict. And in this process, we forget about ourselves. My role is to remind you that you are more important than even the people that you are trying to mediate in their conflict. Because if you are not well, you will not be able to lead them into agreeing. So first take care of yourself. And that's why when I met Wangari, we agreed with her that uh, I will come in and help people to focus on themselves. So what are emotions? What is the difference between physical feelings, emotions, and moods? Because from emotions, we have got feelings. Don't confuse the two. There's a difference between feelings, emotions, and moods. So what is emotional wellness? Come with me. We unpack it so that we are able now to understand it proper. So a picture is worth a thousand words, a picture. So I want to invite you now, you go to the chat box and tell me which picture 
Uh, we're going to calculate them this way. There are, there, are, there are nine pictures. So when you start from the first one, you go along on to, to your left. One, two, three. Then the second row, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I want you to tell me which picture here express which feeling? Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, and shame. Those are the feelings that we express emotions on. So I want you to get, tell me, I will be going to Ongari, you will be reading for me later. We'll have a break a bit so that you can tell me what you have put on the chat box. Get to the chat box and let me know what you have put in there. Then these five uh, feelings, hey, they generate so much emotions. This, they are in three levels. There's a high, there's a medium and the low. If you go to happiness, when you're sad, when you're angry, when you're afraid, when you're ashamed, what are you experiencing? There are different words which are used to explain different levels of feelings. Example, when you're happy, when you're happy, you would say you're excited, you are overjoyed, you are thrilled. Let's look at thrill. Let's say you are thrilled when you're happy. So what is the equivalent? When you're thrilled is when it is at the highest. Then when you go to the medium level, what will you say? You are satisfied. And when you go to the lower level, the same case, it's the same feeling that you're explaining, but you can say you are feeling fine. Just feeling fine, feeling all right. So all these different uh, levels of uh, expressing our feelings, they are helping us to understand who you are. And in mediation, by the way, they all, you go through all this. When you're starting with people when they're in conflict or they have blips, which is the emotion that you expect and you encounter most when you are starting? The add one I know will be the happiness because when people are adding happily, that means you have uh, been able to broker reconciliation in a good way. So which is the emotion that we avoid as mm -hmm. mediators? We don't want anybody to feel ashamed. We don't want anybody to feel angry. We don't want anybody to feel sad. So as mediators, we have to be very careful. So we have to navigate this process. So I would want us to think about what is the effect of emotions in our first day-to-day -day life, how you relate with your spouse, if you are married, with your children, with your parents, with your workmates. What is the role of emotions in that space? It is because of those emotions that uh, we will be able to understand our moods. And let's get it clear here. Moods <laughs> and emotions are not the same. What is a mood? A mood is part of your emotional rhythm, but a little less intense than emotions. Moods can last for hours, while emotions come for a few seconds. A mood is also a general feeling, not a reaction to a particular situation. What about feelings? What about feelings? Feelings, there are more than a hundred words that describe different levels of emotions based on how you feel or experience them. They vary from high, medium, to low. And the example is what I had given on the thrilled, feeling cheerful, and feeling pleased. You're happy. All of them are being happy. Then we have the physical feelings. Physical feelings. The key word here about feelings is that we have the physical ones that we feel, like feeling pain. You can feel heat or cold. Oh, you're feeling tired. I'm feeling very tired. Eh, today is Saturday. Eh? 
you have worked the whole week. So that is different than the way you feel hunger. It's also feeling, feeling hungry or feeling thirsty. You do not, you, you do not experience thirst in the same way you experience heat. So we are trying to understand our emotions, how we relate with emotions. And this is very key so that we can lay the foundation of understanding this key. And that's why I brought it last, because I said emotions are the mother of them all. Let's have an, an, an analysis, a small analysis between what is the difference between emotions and feelings. Wangari, I want you to, let, to help me uh, go through this slide. You are my co-host today. Can you help me to get this difference between emotions and feelings? Okay. Read for me, read for me the emotions and I'll read the feelings. Okay. So emotions come from our thoughts as response to external stimuli. Very good. They come from an external stimuli. Yes. And feelings come from a reaction to the emotions generated by that stimuli. Number two. Emotions are inborn and common to us all. Get this correct. Emotions are inborn. You can do nothing about them. All of them, the good one and the bad one, the one you enjoy and the one you don't enjoy. But they, they are no bad feelings, no emotions, no bad emotions. They are all part of us. So we would want to grow with them and relate with them in the clear way. So emotions are inborn. They are part of us. We cannot do away with them. So I would want us to be able to get that very clear that uh, do not want to fight emotions because you can't. They will still come. And when they come, accept them and go with them the way they are. So we, we have uh, the mm -hmm. emotions mm -hmm. on the opposite side. Feelings are personal and vary with individuals. Angari? So, so thirdly, emotions are automatic. Yes, automatic. So you have nothing to do with them. They just come. You know, happiness. No, something happened, a trigger. Then the message is related to your body system. You become happy. Another one happens, you become angry. Another one happens, you become sad. It's okay but learn how to manage. What we teach in our wellness is how to manage those emotions, not to avoid them. You cannot avoid them. Feelings are shaped by individual temperament and experiences. Individual temperament of experiences. So I wanted us to be able to get this together so that you can be able to understand. And now it's all about you. No person knows your body better than you. It's your responsibility. The world's most sophisticated and self-diagnostic apparatus is your own body's feelings. Mark my words, feelings, not emotions and not moods. So this is very critical. So I would like us to get some of the, uh, some of the emotions, uh, feelings like joy, like anger, surprise, sadness, fear and dig disgust. But this is a key one. Most people don't understand their emotions. Only 36% of the people tested are able to accurately identify the emotions as they happen. Only 36%, you can imagine, this is very low performance. And you need to learn how to get yourself into that space. So keywords here. The four kinds of emotions that are very normal and they are as they're associated with a, either happiness, that is reward, punishment, sadness, or stress. We talked about stress the other time and that stress is one of the things that is taking many people down. This is the week of uh, mental health. 
and mental health come from anxiety over anxious sababu umekosa chapa you don't have money and you did money last week then it it it, it develops to stress and depression so here is how emotions get into your body everything that happens to you it gets it access the body through the spinal cord the reason why emotions you can do nothing about them is when it, the stimuli get into your head they land into the limbic system the limbic is where emotions are expressed most people when never get into the limbic it is arrested there it is never it is never processed past the limbic to go to the logical brain you can google this is very interesting information if you have not please i don't request you to google it later and learn how things happen because you must understand yourself as a mediator you have no choice because you have to understand people when you are mediating them when you see them express the emotions the mood swings and the feelings you need to understand what is going through them the physical pathway for emotional intelligence starts in the brain at the spinal cord your primary senses enter here and must travel to the front of your brain before you can think rationally and that's why the conflicts happen because people are not thinking rationally you want to take more than what belongs to you you don't think about the other person but first they get into the limbic system where you express emotions emotional intelligence requires effective communication between the rational and the emotional centers of the brain keywords communication and i know that you are doing communication in this segment and it's very important so what is emotional wellness after now did those divination now we are on the same page come with me then we can now be able to understand what what when can you say that you are emotionally well emotional wellness is being able to express your feelings adjusting to challenges coping with stress that life brings because it always brings stress life you can't avoid that again and be able to enjoy life we normally say feel the fear but do it anyway mm -hmm. feel the fear but do it anyway like in business you can't start business without experiencing this most people are arrested and paralyzed by fear when you want to mediate cases and they are very sensitive you also need to have been able to get that level of feel the fear yes but talk to them tell them to sit down bring them together and let them go so characteristics of emotionally well people self awareness that is very golden because it start with me then to wangari i will not be able to help wangari if i don't understand me because we all experience emotions none does not even when you are the one who even a judge let's talk about the judiciary itself first because we are assisting the judiciary to have an alternative way to resolve disputes and i want us to understand why it's better to get the mediation way than the judicial way self awareness this is being able to navigate distress or elation that one is the opposite of the other you are either in distress or elation and redirect emotions if necessary self acceptance what is self acceptance so self acceptance on the other side uh, is is to know when, when you know when to provide room for themselves to process emotions you accept yourself and you know when to provide room to process emotions self care we did this self care during uh, our health because you must first take care of yourself you more than anybody else requires self care so emotional well people they practice self compassion and you love yourself physical care yes do you go for massage do you have me time and i want to ask you please don't just work for other people and you're not working for yourself do these things they are good yes and i told you that i'll help you to make money so that you can afford them because you can't afford them you are going to get stressed and uh, 
Don't fear. Money by the to make money is not difficult. It's easy. You just need to change your mind. Don't see it as a difficult thing. They do not neglect any pillar of health. Any of them, they not emotional agility, able to thrive even during emotional setbacks. Because setbacks will come. Yes, they will. So if you're told that they will not come, the person who is telling you is not telling the truth. Then we have coping skills. Coping skills, because after they have come, how do you cope? This is developed by consistent practice. Practice, not reading in books or watching YouTube. Nowadays, you have got that element of watching YouTube, so much YouTube and you think that you, to me, Elewa, TikTok. They are good. I'm not saying you don't watch TikTok. Do it. Enjoy it. But please, follow it with some action. Kindness. Are you kind? This is a mark of emotional wellness. Being able to approach people, even those who are below you, with compassion. How do you deal with people who are serving you? Let's say you are a, okay, in your house. How do you deal with your house help? How do you deal with the person who opened the gate for you? How do you do with the scaries at the gates? That shows your level of emotional wellness. Integrity. The integrity is key. It's another act of somebody who is emotionally well. It's all about emotions. I told you this is the mother of all. So they are people who are emotional are guided by unbending fidelity to what is right without expectations of reward. So you don't do things because you're expecting the feedback. It's like in mediation. You can agree with me that uh, we mediate cases not because of what you're going to be paid and because you feel that these parties need to come together. And you do not allow yourself to be influenced by the party which has money. In most cases, the ones that especially personally handle, I see the person who has more money is the one who wants to take advantage of those who don't have. Very bad. As a mediator, I am not influenced or intimidated by the person who has money. You know, <laughs> Chapa has got a way of intimidating. It has a way of intimidating. Remember the case of the rich man in uh, Razaras? So if you are called to mediate between them, it's likely that you might actually lean towards, <laughs> you know, you know which side, you know which side, I'm not going to say it. Living with purpose, what is purpose? Using your lived experience to serve other people rather than getting stuck in self aggrandizement It's not about you. Managing stress. Yes, when you are emotionally aware, well, because stress comes, you cannot avoid it. We say it is, we get this read that it is automatic. They can recognize stress and know what to do. Or the go-to activities. Like when you go for a jogging, you go for swimming, you go for a walk in the bundus, it's going to help you to bring your stress down. So these are some of the ways that we manage stress and it is important. Look at this tree and look at what is yours here. What affects, what are the key takeaways that you can get from this tree? Anger management, stress tolerance, empathy, empathy, you must empathize with your team, communication, social skills, flexibility. You know, all these are very important for a mediator. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to the worst, you even have to be assertive. You remember Kofi Annan? When the combatants in the 208 were not getting together, he even suspended the mediation process and he had to take it to the next level. So what role do emotions play in mediation? We understand it now, but we are mediators. So let's bring it home. What role do emotions play in mediation? Mediation is an emotional process. True or false? Who can agree with me? Mediation is an emotional process. It in Agari, can you agree? I I, I, I do. Yeah, I, I hear you actually. And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm actually just nodding my head is because um, one of the advanced uh, questions we had with, uh, with you, and I can see also in the chat, uh, there's comments here. Pascal Yamenge says very true. 
is uh, one question we had is that uh, when dealing with uh, family matters in mediation, the, the women seem to be very emotional, but also even the men seem to be very emotional, which, well, the, the question says it is very surprising because you actually see that men also become emotional in the family matter mediation. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it's true. We say that emotion, emotions are human. No, nobody doesn't have them. It's how you manage them. So men somehow tend to hold onto the emotions more than ladies. Ladies express them more. So we will be, learn, we'll be learning more, but then this subject is so wide. It can't be finished within 50 minutes. The one you have given me, but I know you also script for time. So we'll be needing much more on this, but it involves emotions feelings and mood swings. That is mediation. The emotional mind harnesses the rational mind to its purpose and can distort some realities. So be very careful when you're a mediator because there are some realities that can get distorted by emotions. You see somebody breaks and you're mediating, you might tend to go to their side. And some people are, they are very, they're experts in actually demonstrating how hurt they are or how, how they wronged they are. And it could be the one who have wronged. So as a mediator, don't go with the emotions. When you are high in emotions, it can impede rational thinking. Have you ever been to a mediation process where the, one of them break down and uh, you start now trying to get them back to normal senses? And the more you try, the more they get deeper into crying. And uh, sometimes it may also affect you. You're a human being. So be able to detach yourself from the emotional uh, expressions and feelings. So emotions play a big part in conflict, very big. The victim express certain emotions of victimhood. The, prosecu the persecutor has got their own level, the instigator in the rescuer, which, which one do you play? The role of a mediator or a counsel is to provide an opportunity and create an environment where participants can express their emotions in a constructive way. And this is why I have been saying, I have been, I'm sorry that I have been uh, throwing so much into your chat, because I have been trying to bring you up to speed on how critical we need to prepare ourselves as mediators to be able to help in conflict transformation. Dispute resolution with, without the courtroom requires very high levels of emotional knowledge. Understanding emotion is important because emotions are fueling conflict. One of the reasons why people get into conflict is because of emotions. A mediator needs to understand that emotional process in order to support the mediation effort. If you don't understand how medi emotions have developed into the conflict that you are being called to mediate, you might not be able to become a very effective mediator. Neuroscience suggests that it, even the simplest of situations, our decision making is unavoidably informed by emotions. As a mediator, are you aware of this? And what do you do? How do you navigate this? And because you want to arrive at the best situation, make sure that you do it in the right way. A mediator's comfort level with his own emotions will often dictate the level of emotional expression, his or her emotional ex expression. And thus may limit or expand opportunities to arrive at a resolution. This is the most difficult part I normally see in mediation because you should be able to stabilize the other parties. So when they go down, you should hold them up. So if you are not strong emotionally, then you become like them. It's like when you go to comfort people when they are in a sad situation, you go to cry instead of now comforting them. Hello, what role do you play when somebody has passed on? Some researchers suggest that uh, the positive emotions encourage innovation and action positive, while negative emotions fosters self-centeredness behaviors. That's research. Understanding emotions, both the mediators and participants, and then having the ability to deal effectively 
with the emotions is referred to as emotional literacy. And we all need emotional literacy. And we need to teach other people emotional literacy because if you are mediating people who already have emotional literacy, it's very easy. You go in a much better way. Others have referred to a mediator's ability to recognize his emotions as well as the emotions of the participants as emotional intelligence or emotional quantity. So what is a emotional intelligence? That is another level, by the way. We're just talking about understanding emotions and emotional literacy. It is important also to be able to understand emotional intelligence. So emotional literacy is being aware of the emotions you are experiencing, being able to detect. You remember only 36% or the people tested are able to understand their emotions as they happen. So understanding emotions both, no, no. Yes, understanding why you might be feeling an emotion is very important. Either a sad one, either a happy one. It is very, very important the reason behind knowing the most effective way to express feelings and being able to put it into action, not just understanding. Understanding and taking into account the feelings of others, those others, and adjusting your responses accordingly is the mark of a good mediator. And we pointed out that uh, self-awareness is very important. Self-management, there's awareness and there's managing empathy. Then we have got social awareness. Social awareness about other people now. When you are now a mediator, you are going to the social realm because you are taking it to the other people. But it starts with you and then you take it to other people. Then you have got social management also. You have to manage the two parties because in a conflict, there are always three parties. There is you, the mediator. There is a wronged and the... <laughs> okay, there are two parties. There's no one who is wronged anyway, but there is a dispute. So there must be two parties, otherwise there will be no conflict without two parties. And you have the third party that comes in between. All are important attributes for the mediator who can constructively work with emotional participants. And they are emotional. They are emotional. There is, one guy read for me this quote in the good book. Okay, um, so this is um, Hosea for uh, six, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Thank you. My role as a mediator, as a, as a wellness trainer, is to ensure that uh, people are not destroyed by lack of knowledge. I know knowledge is very important. And uh, if you think wellness is expensive, try illness, try ignorance invest in knowledge and that's why thank you Agari for inviting me into this process because it's been my pleasure for the time that uh, you have been uh, inviting me to speak to mediators. I hope you have all seen the importance of learning wellness and playing it because it contributes a lot in your capacity as a mediator. I will be working with you on this if called upon any other time. So on that it's been, thank you very much. And I can take questions if there's some minutes. Asante sana coach Maina for uh, the walking us through. Um, so today's session on uh, the wellness coaching, we were focusing on uh, emotional wellness. And uh, this is the fourth uh, segment of uh, the uh, flow on wellness. We started off uh, on physical, uh, we, we, we had a session on physical wellness, uh, mental wellness, financial wellness, and this is the concluding one. We are looking forward to November when we have the integration uh, weekend and we will be able to have an integration of all, just all these areas which we have been uh, coached in. So thank you Coach Maina for your insights. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, be able to just run through, if I may, uh, the, uh, uh, I'll run through the comments that are in the chat and also the questions. Uh, we had uh, some advanced questions. You may kindly just receive them and give us your, your feedback in uh, 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 three minutes. So the, the inquiry you had given with regard to whether uh, mediation is, is, is an emotional matter, I see that Susan Wendot says very true. I've just concluded a very emotional mediation matter. And uh, it's quite interesting when uh, she, po she posits it as a, 
an emotional mediation matter. Um, it probably may have been on property, it may have been on ch ch children, it may have been really on something else. But I think for the mediator, it lands as an emotional mediation matter, or yeah, the emotions were quite high. Um, but yes, uh, Caroline on Chico family mediation is really emotional feelings and moods. And um, I think it will also be interesting later when uh, also Dr. Sharon Sutherland is speaking to us um, as a very highly experienced uh, mediator, just what she will say also um, about this area, especially around family uh, matters. Um, mm -hmm. Then also why Remo says very true, sometimes as the mediator, you have to take a break for the parties to calm down. And um, I think with that also, it may actually be sometimes even the break is given for the mediator, not only just um, for, for the parties themselves. We have a question from Caroline Onjiko. What happens when in mediation you get informed that there has been a situation of use of black magic? So that uh, probably you can uh, let us know in terms of just what it does either to uh, the either nikuvuruga the emotions or uh, it's to stimulate the emotions, just what happens behind the scenes uh, with that and also just how as a mediator to handle it. And uh, also uh, maybe if someone is going into a mediation, how they can be able to, to, um, um, to handle that. So the, the questions that we had in advance, um, I will just run through them and please um, just uh, work, uh, take them in together and compress them in your response. So um, the earlier comment that um, uh, during mediation, men also uh, bring out emotions. Um, it is not only the women and especially in family cases, then also we had a, a comment or a question, is mental health a major issue now because people don't know how to handle their emotions or is it that there are no avenues um, to, to, to either support or to be able to uh, channel? Then uh, the other one is uh, uh, the, a, a question, does this mean that mediators are dealing with people when they're not stable, when they come in for the mediation or, uh, at the same time, so they're not stable to emotionally deal with the issue that's affecting them. I think probably just like the comment that was given by Susan Wendot when she says that she was dealing with a highly emotional mediation matter. Um, so does it mean that we are dealing, as mediators, we are dealing with people who are not stable um, emotionally um, to handle the issue that's affecting them? And then also tied to that also is, um, again, or is it that mediators may not even be um, emotionally stable? to actually be given responsibilities um, to mediate. So Coach Maina, uh, over to you, if you may kindly just give us that in, um, in, 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 in five minutes so that then we can just follow this with a five minutes break and then have the second part of the session. Thank you very much, Coach Maina, to you. Thank you, thank you, th thank you very much for that. And I'm happy that uh, people have been uh, quite active and uh, I appreciate your comments, thank you. Uh, one, uh, black magic. There's what we call emotional manipulation. Emotional manipulation. What those people are doing, they're just manipulating emotions. Abracadabras. You need to understand them. And that's why you have to be very strong. You must have self-awareness so that you can even understand the games they are playing. They're just trying to manipulate your emotions so that you can go their way. Don't get over that. And this is not a choice. You must learn how to manage emotions and you start by understanding. So the next question on if the people who you're dealing with are not emotionally well. Yes, it is true. Most people are not. We only say that 36%. Even you as a mediator, you also have the same challenges. We have it, I have it as well. It is a lifelong process to be able to control your reactions to emotions. You said you can never stop emotions. You need to be able to identify them, know the effect, and know how to manage them, to navigate the emotions, but not to stop them. We all have that challenge, but the mark is how well can you be able to navigate your own emotions. That is self-management. Then you go to the social management. First, you understand the emotions that people are going through. You can tell between being sad and being, uh, uh, being uh, sorrow, sorrowful and sadness. It's very close relationship, but they're not the same. And I had asked that picture, uh, Gary did not even tell me what people said about the picture that I had given. But anyway, I know we are pressed for time. So it is important for you to be able to read the mood in people's face. When you see somebody is a, a, a sad person and an angry person, you should be able to tell the difference so that you can know how to handle them. It is you 
who have been honored to be called as the mediator, who is managing the process. So it's very important and we've got to do this well. You have the responsibility first and foremost to be able to train yourself how to manage your emotions so that you can be able to overcome the influences and the limitations that are brought about by not being emotionally well. This is a very critical subject and we need to work on it. The issue of uh, mental wellness, why it is increasing, why it is a big problem now. Yes, both of them are at par. The uh, capacity to be able to take care of the mental issues, most of them actually are not even psychiatric cases. They are those which move to the level of psychiatrists. If we had more emotional wellness in any uh, practitioners, we'll be able to handle our mental issues before they get to the level of uh, depression. Because depression, cl clinical depression, requires a psychiatry. Psychologists will handle it from the time it is from a, an, of anxiety to stress before it gets to depression. And depression also has got several levels. But now what is happening is that because Kenya, we have got only 26 psychiatrists, 26, the whole country, in a country of 50 million plus people, they can't manage. And we have got a thing about only 300 uh, psychiatrists, nurse, nurse, psychiatrists, nurse. So the psychologists are doing very good work, but they're also not many, the psychologists. And the counselors are also doing this level. Because when you have more people who can understand what people are going through, and how they can help them to navigate and manage their emotions. And that's why emotional wellness, I would like to encourage you also to join. You know, I'm in both in coaching, I'm in mediation, I'm in uh, mentorship, I'm in many areas. So you can also manage it. It's good because if you are a people's person, all these things are important and we can do them together. Otherwise, how will you mediate on con in conflicts when the people who are in conflict already have emotional problems? It's your capacity to handle that part first will lead you now to get to the second stage. So they work together and I would like to ask you to go with them together so that you can have them going. Otherwise, it will be my pleasure. Maybe we're getting when you organize another forum where we can have more of these talks. We can do better. But for now, because of our time and I know the program is continuing, I'm not the last speaker, I'm actually the first speaker. It's only a pleasure to ask me to speak first. Uh, so that I can introduce, I am a keynote uh, speaker. So I, <laughs> I get a pleasure to do that. So we can do this more. And because I'm a mediator, I will be continuing with the Vasiliana. It was a pleasure to be invited to be the one giving the opening uh, remarks. And thank you very much. I'll be with you today. I'm not going anywhere. I finished what I was doing earlier. And I apologize for being a bit late because <laughs> many questions came and I had to handle them. Otherwise, you would have seen as if I'm running away. Even now, I'm getting the other questions. Don't fear to throw them out if you have a chance. Otherwise, I'm ready, able, and willing. Thank you. OK. As Asante Sana, Coach Maina, yes, we have uh, comments and uh, questions in the chat. Um, I, I, will, I will just read them. Um, uh, Dr. Sharon, we will be coming on to you in uh, 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 five minutes' time. Our break will be for three minutes, so that I will read these questions and Coach Maina as uh, please have them with you, even if we will be able to tackle them now next month when we have the integration weekend. But um, they're, they're very interesting comments. So Caroline Wanjiko, I have mediated family issues where you find men expressing their frustrations and hopelessness. My strengths were that I was able to interrogate. Um, we are using counseling skills in regards to helping as much as they still went on with, for, uh, with the, the divorce. They healed or rather they were more emotionally stable. I think this is the area that speaks into uh, when someone chooses to be what we are calling a conflict transformation mediator, that you will actually also have um, other, either other practitioners or there are other skills that you're able to bring into the mediation or you're able to redirect the person so that they can be able to be taken, to take care of themselves and then be able to uh, uh, be in the mediation when they are, let me say, much more well. Um, the second comment from Steve Mutemboa, does it mean if you're a mediator because of some reasons you feel you are not mentally fit enough, emotional or emotionally disturbed, that um, you um, to mediate on a particular matter, you should recast yourself? 
that is an interesting approach and uh, possibly yes, as uh, mediators, that is uh, um, a recommendation. I think we've also had situations where uh, either uh, someone has stepped aside and said, please give this matter to someone else or even a doctor. You've had a doctor who said, okay, yeah, for this operation, could you please then please give it to another professional person. Then Mini Mangeli says, I find the how to cope with setbacks very important. This determines how uh, one navigates the emotions and cross over to the other side. We need uh, uh, we need more train. We need uh, training on how to remain consistent. Okay, Coach Maina, homework for you. Um, so Pascalia Maina says, see yourself first as a person with natural emotions before seeing yourself as a professional mediator. I think that's very very useful advice uh, for us as mediators. And self awareness and self management are critical to one's mental and emotional well being. Margaret Kizai, me time before taking care of others. I think that was emphasized by Coach Minor. Uh, Caroline Wanjiko, as mediators, I say we aren't superwoman or superman. We need at times to take a break and reevaluate and reassess ourselves holistically so as to get our energy back and find ways to re strategize to help the parties. I really think that. Uh, that statement uh, that, and, and just those closing, uh, those, those, those uh, uh, comments that have come in have really just pointed out why when we set out uh, this national fellowship uh, uh, for mediators uh, in Kenya as a, a part of the program on conflict transformation, it was very clear. First, let's focus on the wellness of the practitioner. When the mediator is well, then they can be able to go out and support everyone else to be um, well. Self-awareness, self-acceptance starts with me as a mediator. That is why Remo, who has given us that comment. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a three minutes break. It is 10 minutes past 11. Uh, please uh, refill your glass, uh, stretch, um, stand up and stretch. And then when we come back, we will now have Dr. Sharon Sutherland. Um, we are in good time for her session. So Asante Nisana, please uh, do take your water break and refill your glass. God bless you. Thank you. So uh, we uh, welcome back uh, Mediator Fellows and uh, we are now on our second part of our uh, fellowship weekend four, which is the impact weekend. And uh, specifically this um, uh, segment of the uh, fellowship weekend is on the pra practice development coaching. And uh, we will be now focusing on the impact uh, coaching, which is basically on movement building and internationalism. And uh, to take us through this session is our fellowship co-director and coach, Dr. Sharon Sutherland, who is the director of strategic innovation and director of research at um, Mediate BC in Canada. So Dr. Sharon Sutherland, uh, it's now truly good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. And yes, it yes. is a, it is difficult to uh, to think of it as morning here. Um, I will say it is 1.15 a.m. So it is yes. it is officially morning. However, yes. it is very dark and I recognize mm -hmm. that I will continue to have reflections that demonstrate that on my glasses. So apologies for it for that. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to get started and I'm, and I'm very and I really am delighted to join everybody here and I hope everybody's uh, off to a good start already today. Lovely. So Dr. Sharon, yes, uh, please take it away. And uh, yeah, this is your segment for this next uh, part of the hour. Asante Great. Sana. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to also share some slides. Um, so I will rely on uh, you, Wangari, to make sure that I do notice anything. I have the chat up, but I will not necessarily see it. But I do want to encourage everybody to please, please do feel free to um, put notes into the chat. Um, it, it's always very interesting to be speaking into a computer as opposed to um, chatting with people and seeing faces in response. Um, so I do absolutely encourage you to share questions, um, any comments or things throughout. I'll try to monitor them. I may not get to them immediately and we'll certainly circle back to them. Um, but one of the things that you do by providing them throughout is you make sure make sure that I know that I am actually addressing things that are of use to you. Um, because I think one of the things I want to start with here is I'm I've been invited to speak about movement building and internationalism. Um, movement building is where I'm going to place the majority of my focus today because 
Um, my sense is that as you're starting out in practices and trying to build practices, that that is one of the first places you want to be addressing most of your attention and in a couple of different ways. Um, but that said, every, every community is different. Um, the difference between um, where I am in British Columbia and where I originated my practice in Ontario is actually dramatic. There was very little commonality in the way things could be developed there, but there were ideas that could be taken one from, from one place to the other. Um, I anticipate that there will similarly be things that will resonate with you as idea generation um, from things that I'm talking about. And there will be things that maybe don't resonate as much. And if they don't, if I'm going down a path that just absolutely you're thinking that has no application to the way that I'm addressing things, please let me know. Um, so I, I, and, and I say that because I will try to stay with things that resonate the most, but also, um, also because sometimes it's interesting to talk about those the most. Um, one of the things that I learned doing mediation mentoring and a huge amount of my practice over the last um, 20 plus years has been building mentoring programs um, for people coming into mediation um, and building quite extensive programs where people are working with mentors over a period of several months to develop um, to get 10 um, co-mediations in and to pass on in our in our world, you need 10 mediations to get onto most mediator rosters as a starting point. So doing those as co-mediations. And one of the most important things that has really come up in doing that work for me is the degree to which working with people who come from completely different backgrounds and have completely different processes um, actually is often one of the more valuable things because things that you would never think of sometimes trigger different ideas. They sometimes, yeah, wouldn't do it that way, but I wonder if there is a way that that idea could apply. And suddenly you've got ideas that actually are new, that are not things that you're coming up with when you're generating your own. So I will mention things that I'm not certain connect, but please do tell me if I'm really going off in funny directions because, you know, because it's one in the morning and it could happen at any point. All right, so on that, when I think about um, movement building, I, I, I frame it as the need to build a culture of mediation, a need to build that culture in a couple of different ways. You need to first be building a community of practice, a community of practitioners. The fellowship program is very much focused on exactly that kind of opportunity um, and the important things that you can draw from connections, um, meeting with other mediators, creating a sense that you are in it together, that you are building things together and that you're drawing on each other's ideas. So very much that building a culture and a group, uh, a community of practice and practitioners is a really critical piece. But the other piece is also sharing that culture brought more broadly, creating, creating a culture of mediation more broadly within your community. And that can be smaller within, um, within a very discreet community, and it can be nationally, and it can be internationally. Um, but creating awareness is a really big piece of this. And I tend to be framing this part of the, of the movement um, building as, as about public education, as about awareness building. Um, and you'll find that using those terms often will connect you to other kinds of tools around what do we do for public education? How do we bring awareness um, into the community? So these are things that I have been doing um, since about 1996. That was when I started uh, working with um, initially with courts in Toronto and in 97 was when I started working with the group that became the um, Mediate BC eventually. Um, and so was actually developing a full roster of mediators, um, qualifications, credentials for mediators in British Columbia, mentorship programs, etc. But when I started, uh, we were at a place where there was 
very little mediation, very little mediation training, and absolutely minimal community. There were a couple of groups that called themselves pioneers of mediation, um, and they met for lunches once a month. And they would re reference themselves as they were they were it they were the mediators. It was not a group one could join. It was not a way one could build practice. It was a really really isolating sense when people tried to come through training. So um, so I will be reflecting on the ways in which we have addressed things, ideas that we've had, and things that have worked particularly well in in that development to get to a place where we now have a what I would call a really robust um, community of practice, a really um, robust um, ability to meet with and engage with other mediators on a very, very regular basis in order to talk about both practice and about practice development and public education. So flipping on, so I, I, this, this is not, this is not, the the map the roadmap to uh creating everything what this is is me taking 15 minutes um before i got on this af this evening to start thinking about well what are the clusters of things we talk about that might be idea generating um and actually i would encourage you um to do something like this one of the practice skills that i actually learned um and developed quite well through the process of community of, of sitting down with a group of other mediators is actually doing a bunch of mind mapping. Um, I do some mind mapping. I do some graphic facilitation now. So I will actually try to capture things um, visually um, with pen, pen and paper, big sheets on the walls. Um, you're not seeing that reflected here because I just, I, I didn't have the space to be drawing something, but Trying to capture that visually often helps in the brainstorming process. And I'd really encourage you to think about just, just sitting down and with a group and mind mapping. What I've broken this down to is how it, how it fit in my brain this evening was that when we're talking about community building within groups of mediators, there, were, there are kind of three different ways I think of them. There's these discussion groups. So, those are sessions, those are getting together with a few colleagues, um, could be larger or smaller groups, but the intention is simply to come together to talk about topics of interest generally to mediators. So continuing from the fellowship, you may have groups of people that you have found there's 10 of us who have a really strong interest in family mediation. We have a specific subject matter reason to get together. You may find there's people who are just in my community located close to me. There are people that I just get along with really well or people who have similar um, approaches to mediation. And I might like to leave this fellowship or go outside the fellowship and draw together communities where I can, where we can invite people to sit down and talk through specific topics monthly, um, weekly, whatever the, whatever the need is, um, where we might get together to do practice sessions. Um, we do a lot of um, both formal and informal role-playing gatherings here. So people who are trying to stay current and practice or develop new skills um, will often have monthly role play sessions. Um, and sometimes we set them up formally and invite coaches to participate in those because um, having somebody outside participating is really, really valuable. Uh, but often people will simply gather um, and create their own role plays and film them potentially, um, pull out that cell phone and, and record it for feedback or simply give the opportunity to practice and give feedback to each other. Um, these can be things where you're bringing in guest speakers, where you're doing all kinds of things, but it's around special interest, it's around small groups, it's that kind of discussion. Um, I added social at the end here, and the reason I did is because some of the, um, some of the most impactful discussion groups that I have been aware of here are groups that really started as going out for drinks at a pub every Friday. Um, and there's a group um, in a really in a smaller town in British Columbia that started meeting. They they started over dinner. It it, it 
turned into um, a bit of a uh, cocktails on Friday evenings. And they managed to develop um, a practice of mediation in that community, with a, starting with a group of five mediators in a community of about, about 90,000 people widely. Um, but they all became able to, able to run completely um, self-supporting mediation practices full time within a period of about two years. In our area, that is fast for five people to get there because it, it, some people will get there that faster, faster, um, really depends on where you start from. But to have an entire group get there at that speed, it clearly was tied to the ways that they were supporting each other and the ways that they were creating the community and the opportunity to discuss that was explicitly about how are you doing? Um, I think this, this actually ties to our previous speaker's um, comments, I think quite considerably, um, in as much as one of the things that's absolutely crucial is wellness and happiness and community. All of those things are tied together in the way that we support each other and in the way that we get we are able to work in, work in this field. We need to actually maintain our spirits um, and our motivation as we move forward in this area. Um, I, you'll see a bigger cluster there when I talk about practice groups. Um, those are, I'm thinking about much more um, formalized sessions that are that are, might be setting up actual partnerships, could be businesses, could be figuring out how to share facilities, how to share scheduling, could be making arrangements and plans to co-mediate with others, um, could be looking at um, mechanisms for cross-referral. Here's I've got something coming in. What would you like to do? And I'm happy to talk about some of the different ways that those things can work if they're of interest to you. Um, but it's really kind of generating those ideas about what are the things that will support you? Um, do you need a marketing collaborative? Do you need writing groups that might be around? How do we get together to do the writing? Fellowship is providing that right now in terms of some form of support in terms of putting together different things that could be marketing. But do you need that on a continuing basis as an accountability piece? Um, the other kinds of things that, that I've clustered are the mentorship notions. And this is a little bit different than the peer, um, the peer to peer models that the rest of it looks at. It's, um, it is working with people who may be able to support you who have more experience and what kind of relationships you might be able to build there. There's a lot of different places where, um, where formal structures can be created. And that might be something that one wants to set up, that it might be a, a project for um, coming out of the fellowship. It might be a project elsewhere. There might be something with it, a very formalized model that gets set up. But there's a lot of opportunities for really uh, for less formal or what I would refer to um, as unbundled um, mentorship. You don't necessarily, a mentorship doesn't mean committing to working with one person through their entire practice development. It might be um, connecting with people who can help you with one part of it or are willing to co-mediate with you once or just will have coffee with you every six months to, to talk about your preparation and debriefing. Um, some of the more successful mediators that I'm aware of here really got their start by having that one kind of connection where they would have a person that they could call each time they got a new file. Um, they would call up and say, okay, before I start, what are the things that I might want to talk about? What are the things I might want to do? Um, and just talk through possibilities so that they felt confident, they were prepared, they weren't missing anything in terms of what they might do. And then debriefing afterwards about what went well, because mediation is an incredibly, it can be incredibly isolating depending on how you practice and where you practice. Um, one of the biggest challenges people have around mediation is, is that they will just go, they will be the only person in the room who is thinking like a mediator. They have nobody to get feedback from. Parties might give them feedback on their experience, but there will be very little um, exchange around how did these skills work? How did this work? Are there dynamics I might want to address differently in, in future? Um, and that can be, 
It can be isolating, um, but it can also lead to poor practice. It can lead people to fall into habits that are bad habits because they're never actually really questioning um, what they're doing. There's, there's no real sense that, ooh, I should change that. It feels like it works. And what, what you see happening very frequently is getting into fairly rigid structures or notions of flow and, and failing to question some of the things that happen around that. Um, so I highly recommend finding, finding a partner, but ideally somebody who is um, in a mentor role who can give you some feedback around those kinds of things, even if it's looking at, um, at occasional check-ins. And as I say, I generated a relatively short list very quickly there. There are so many different ways that one could look at this, but I'm hoping that what you take from a chart like this is the idea of sitting down and brainstorming and throwing all of the ideas out there and thinking about what is it that you specifically would benefit from most in supporting you in developing your practice? Where are the places that you have the needs? I'm going to flip from that um, unless there's any questions around, and I'm happy to at any point to have questions or comments about, about things, but I'll, I'll flip from the notion of building a community um, and with an acknowledgement that, that very much you have the opportunity here and you should, not be, um, you should not be missing out on the opportunities presented by the fellowship to be building community because that is actually an astonishing opportunity to be um, connecting with people who are doing similar kinds of things to you at similar stages of practice for the most part. Um, absolutely. But beyond that, it's obviously a, a crucial part is creating public awareness about mediation. Movement building is definitely about that. It's about um, how do we make people aware? Now, one of it, it is possible, it is absolutely possible to aim big and talk about how do I tell all of Kenya that mediation is a good thing. But I will tell you that it is pretty hard to land things when you're aiming that big, that, that people want different information depending on who they are, depending on what kinds of issues they have. And the global mediation is good is a very, very difficult message to disseminate. Um, I've seen some advertising campaigns around mediation that, that, that try that. Um, one that was particularly interesting um, and particularly ineffective as far as I can tell was um, in movie theaters prior to playing the movie, um, one of the, our mediation organizations bought advertising time in the trailer section to talk about mediation. So it was a really short 15 second clip about mediation. Um, it absolutely raised some sort of public awareness, um, but it didn't translate because it, it, it wasn't connected to anything that was happening for the people who were in that theater at that time. I mean, it, was, it was an interesting idea. I do think that there's you know, real potential for engaging in in film, in television, in storytelling, but embedding it in the story is way more likely to actually um, stick with people and give people a sense of there's something to do. These advertising pieces, they, they just don't connect. Similarly, um, the story about here, here's why mediation is so good only really lands if it's tied in to a story that resonates with the person. So there's a few different things that you might want to think about in that. If there are stories that are being told, um, something that is, there is a conflict ongoing, a social media engagement with that story might pick up some kind of traction because you might connect there. Um, and there are, it's not that there are no ways to do the bigger picture ones, but they tend to need to be around bigger picture conflict. Um, and the challenge there is that it's really hard to have the credibility to speak to it unless you are already somebody who's engaged at that level. So if there's a, a huge political crisis, 
if you're already in, engaged in the politics and you're, you have credibility there, you can absolutely speak to mediation there. But it's substantially harder if no one has any understanding of why you have a connection um, and you're trying to connect that way. Sorry, is that a, is, I'm not sure if somebody's trying to ask a question with that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll continue talking. I'm hearing a, a little bit of feedback from somewhere, but I'm not, I'm not hearing enough words. <laughs> okay. No? Okay. Well, what I'm going to say, though, is rather than going general, Think about your niches. And I think that some of you are doing this very, very effectively in the kinds of work that you're already thinking about doing, the ways that you're creating um, the, the different um, short speeches, the blogs, the, the focus topics. Many of you have identified a really clear um, and narrow area to so focus on and say, this is where mediation helps. What I, I simply have added a few things here saying, give some thought as you're doing it to not just where do you see opportunity for mediation to take place but where do you where do you have credibility already um some of the ways that um, I, i'm going to reflect on kind of my own um development of mediation but i i some of my best development pieces were when i was thinking about what communities i belong to um rather than rather than where do I have credibility because I'm a lawyer, for instance, because that's a very general topic. Could I go mediate in legal disputes? Yes. And there might be specialized legal disputes where people would recognize me as having expertise. But it's also possible to say, OK, I, I have been a volunteer coach and, um, and board member in a number of different sports organizations, community sports and, and provincial sport levels. So um, field hockey, soccer, rugby, I've coached. Um, and so in each of those areas, there's a variety of different kinds of conflicts that come up. Um, many of them are the coach and the coach and parent conflict. Um, sometimes it's a conflict around kids getting selected to um, higher level teams and, and to representing communities. Um, in my world, that's those, those are fairly big areas of conflict. They're fairly constant. And I have credibility as somebody who's been coaching in those areas. And by simply talking about conflict resolution, when things come up and engaging, I started to get invited to do quite a lot of sport mediation. Um, and I was, uh, and it wasn't just in the sports I was coaching because what would happen is there would be these cross referrals. Um, a colleague of mine um, does uh, coaches in volleyball, and another friend coaches in baseball, and they would be seen as having conflict, um, conflict of interest within those sports. So they would invite me to do the volleyball and baseball mediations with the organizations, um, and I would invite them to do the field hockey and soccer ones. So it, it's, a, it's an opportunity that I think we ignore because it's what we're doing in our private life and we forget about our private life being actually fairly crucial. Um, a lot of my other work that has come up in similar kinds of ways has come out of, has come out of those kinds of things that I, I wouldn't even tell people I do um, because I don't think of it as connected to the work. Um, but I get a, I get a lot of referrals around the arts, and a lot of that is because I have done work in theater. I support theater, but it's also because I publish on vampires and zombies and television, and I have been surprised by sharing with that community that works in those areas has actually resulted in that kind of thing gameplay, um, different types of tabletop gaming communities. Think about where you're connected. You'll all have different connections than me. My examples are, are intended only to say, think about where it is for you um, and, it, and think widely. Think about those because there's conflict everywhere. Uh, there's conflict in the local library. There's conflict in the local coffee shop. There's conflict in all those places, but where are the ways you connect to them? Um, think about those. 
And, and building awareness of mediation more generally, rather than making it sound like you're marketing yourself is really crucial. And I've kind of added that as a comment, because it's hard to remember that what you're trying to do actually is build an understanding that mediation is a possibility. You could mediate. Um, you're not, but, but if you're pitching it in a way that sounds like it's about you and you've developed a practice and you're handing out your business card, it doesn't stick in the same way that, oh, in this kind of circumstance, here's a story of how it works, might work. So I, I yeah, I'm, I'm gonna continue on. I'm, I'm watching for any kind of comments, but, uh, but barring any, I'm gonna skip on to the next page. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to one thing just because I'm, I'm thinking hobbies, sports. Here's an example that I actually find really interesting. Um, not something I did. Our um, the chair of Mediate BC of our board of directors, Julie Dom. Um, some of you have heard her speak before. Um, she did something really interesting with no intention whatsoever to make it about public awareness sharing. It wasn't her intention. She was kindly joining us for a five minute talk at a speed geeking session. We had, she was in town, we'd said, Julie, can you drop by and talk about something? And she said, I have nothing to talk about. And we said, just talk about whatever you're most interested in today. And Julie um, is somebody who's very connected with his particular shoe designer. And I really am saying shoe designer. Um, John Fluvog is a designer from Vancouver whose shoes are very famous and he has these, he has very, very interesting followers. So Julie is a, is a vogger, uh, they call themselves, and she's a member of, or maybe five Facebook groups. She knows people and she attends different sessions. And she just said, well, I'm buying shoes today, so I'm going to talk about shoes. So she came in and she talked about the ways in which Fluvogs actually create community. And that little clip ended up not only getting picked up by, um, on Instagram by John Fluvog, the designer, who sent her thank you notes um, for the lovely little comment about community, but she started to get all kinds of questions about mediation from people who were in this community that they they were all over the map. They had all kinds of different backgrounds and they were across, they were international. What they had in common was they really liked these particular shoes. Um, and it's such a it's such a it's such a small area, but it was such an interesting focus. Um, and I think it's a I think it's a really good example of just not closing your mind to when you're thinking about raising public awareness. If you're putting mediation out there in these ways that are not about marketing, but are ways about talking about how it connects to that community, it really truly picks up and, and gets, gets people thinking and they'll come back to you. They'll come back to you six months later. I have some people circling back, you know, it'll be five years after I talked about something, but they'll be going, I need a mediator. Oh, I remember that Sharon talked about this. Let me just phone and ask her what that was about again. It's, it's surprising what sticks. Yeah, so I, I've highlighted um, I've highlighted the fact that the writing is one of the easiest. Writing is is really easy, but so is short videos these days. So is posting things in a variety of different ways. So give some thought to where and how how you can tell stories and where they're shared um, in the community that you're thinking of and thinking narrowly. Where do stories get told? Are they in newsletters? Are they are people always on Twitter? Um, is this only going to be an exchange in Instagram? But um, but try to think about those areas and think about, yeah, for this community, how do I share and how do I share a story? What does a story look like? Um, and I'm going to I'm going to throw out a little bit of a challenge just because uh, might as well. Uh, I have challenged myself after next week when conflict resolution week in BC is over, and we'll mention that briefly, I am overwhelmed until the end of that week, but I have told folks that uh, following that week, I'm going to turn my mind to trying to figure out how to create a really effective mediation TikTok account. Uh, 
there, there's a way. There's a way. The algorithm with TikTok is way more interesting and, and easier to manage than the algorithms for many of the other social media things. And it is a really fast, fun storytelling mechanism that will reach an incredibly different variety of people. So my challenge is I, I would love to see anybody in the fellowship launch a TikTok account. If you do, if you start trying to use TikTok, please, please, please tag me, share with me, send me notes about it. I want to see what's possible there. This is my challenge to myself for November. And I want to see other people join me in the TikTok challenge. All right. <laughs> Wangari has all of my contact information. I think you all have it and are able to access it. And if not, let me please just in that moment, encourage absolutely everybody to connect with me on LinkedIn, because that is the easiest way to connect and stay connected with me. I do respond to, to uh, all of those links and it's probably the easiest way. And you won't have to worry if I change email addresses or anything, but do that and tell me if you're joining me in the challenge. Okay. All right. I'm gonna turn to internationalism. As I said, I was kind of conscious to just with timing going into this, that I wouldn't have a huge amount of time to talk about internationalism as a as an overall theme. But I do want to I, I do want to emphasize just how valuable it is to take advantage of the opportunities to connect with people across borders right now. Um, the, it, it's it always always it doesn't matter how long we go on it feels weird to say but having gone into this world where everybody is online for such an extended period of time and has developed the skills to be online and the comfort to be online and to engage online the opportunities for development of your own practice your own knowledge your own um is, is amazing but your ability to connect with people in other countries where they've in many cases have already um, taken on some of the challenges that you're currently facing um, or have completely different ideas that that really, really benefit you. I would really encourage you to take advantage as much as as much as possible. And on that note, I did th this here. Uh, I, I've kind of thrown up. There's a lot of different kinds of organizations that you could connect with. Some of them are organizations you might want to join. When you think about membership, though, um, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to list off a bunch that you should join. And I'm doing that intentionally because I think there's no right answer for everybody on this call. There will be ones that are commonly of interest to people who might have an interest in business, for instance. Um, but even then, it's are you interested in um, international transactions or are you interested in small business and looking for groups that talk about small business that might be more local? Are you looking at family practice? Are you looking at practice in the world of technology, ODR? Um, virtually every every type of practice area that you have an interest in will have better choices. Um, in terms of organizations that you might want to either join or simply sign up for um, newsletters with. All of those are likely are ways to get good information and to be made aware of the different kinds of training opportunities and conference opportunities. And right now, there are so many conference opportunities um, that you can attend everywhere. Um, one group that I will say is probably worth checking out for many of you is Mediators Beyond Borders. And I'm not sure if you, um, if anybody's connected with them yet. They're an international group. And depending on the area, they have, um, they have some incredibly strong um, groups. Canada has become relatively strong recently. The United States is much stronger. But there are also quite a number of other countries that have incredible engagement with the organization. And what I find most interesting about the organization is that they offer some really good, really inexpensive or free um, talks about topics that are very, very wide ranging. And they offer them in different time zones. So you don't, you're not tied to, oh, 
I mean, I have a predisposition to find things that are in the United States or Canada simply because I'm awake. Um, but uh, but mediators beyond borders offer in a variety of different time zones depending on where their speakers are coming from. So it's one that I, I will put out there. Um, but I would definitely encourage you to think about think about the conferences, but also um, courses. There are a lot of courses that will give that will do different kinds of skill sets. There's a lot of um, conflict coaching courses out there now that are being that have shifted onto into an online mode, and they will offer specialized skills that may or may not be available in the training that you have locally. Um, and and I say that knowing that every country is a little different in what training they offer. I find that here, um, you know, being in British Columbia, we, we have entirely different training than just across the border into an, in another province in Canada. Um, it is dramatically different. Um, and I frequently attend things in other provinces or in other states, because now that things are online, I can pick up different skills training. Um, in different kinds of places and add to add to the toolbox in different ways. So I'm going to encourage you to think about those kinds of things. Um, I know that we don't really we don't really have time this evening for me to give you a giant list and it doesn't make any sense anyway because each of you will have your specific things. But I do want to be really clear that um, I am open to chatting with people individually about what might work for them and helping them to to find ways to do it. And chatting, um, if you want to send comments through Wangari, um, we talk, we talk most weeks. Um, so that would be really, I think, easy. And we can definitely do that. So send notes and talk about it. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to say that's a general question um, that that I would actually put two others. But for me, most of the opportunities that I've been taking advantage of have been participating in talks um, that are from groups that I would not normally follow, um, that I didn't even know existed. I'm attending talks from um, Pepperdine University, which has the Strauss Institute of Conflict Resolution, um, and they're allowing allowing me to participate. Um, are you, are, and when, when Gary, I just wanna make sure when you're talking about that, are you thinking about also opportunities to mediate virtually, or are you talk, talking about the connection piece? Uh, that, thank you, Dr. Sharon. So the yeah, the question is, and and also this is to our uh, uh, the fellows who are on the call. Yeah. Um, as a mediator, with what opportunities have you taken up with the virtual space um, opening up? And uh, I'm, I'm glad, and it's quite interesting that you've 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 pointed out um, like participating in the uh, Pepperdine um, University. Uh, the dispute resolution uh, center uh, forums. I mean, those have just been some of the exciting opportunities that would, I mean, ideally that would have been an air ticket to have to go to the US to Pepperdine University and yeah, and and and, and participate in let's say like a forum, but uh, yeah, they've opened up. So with the discussion we are having now that is around movement building and uh, and internationalism, it's really more about the connecting and also mm -hmm. the just as you pointed out with the with the slide that we have there, the opportunities to you know to to take on courses which we probably may not have had access to. Um, at the same time, um, I think really relevant with um, the fellowship is the, the just the appreciation of the con of the concept of mediators as speakers, because then one is able to position themselves to participate in conferences that are now international or or again even for us in Kenya here we've now we've been able to have uh, speakers who are from, I mean, out of Kenya and out of the region participating in our, in our forum. So I believe it's actually yeah. two way. So yes, the practice opportunity may be, may come, but I think this is more about that connecting with the community of practice and um, other professionals. But then that's also what now gives the opportunity to be able to be known, then you can practice. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Ab absolutely. Um, and I would absolutely emphasize when, when you talk about those opportunities for speaking, because it's not just attending conferences. Um, attending courses, yes, you're just attending courses. Um, there's often a short talks. Increasingly, there are short talks that are incredibly accessible and affordable. 
Um, it used to be that you had to travel to different things for longer conferences, and they would be very expensive as well as the travel. But uh, that has changed, and it is they're much, much more accessible now, and many, many are free. But being a speaker adds that extra piece. In the conflict resolution world, you will find some conferences where um, the expectation is that you pay, even though you're a speaker. So you will definitely find those where there might be a discounted fee to participate. Um, American Bar Association does that, for instance. They have an amazing conference in terms of sheer quantity of speakers. I think they have something like 12 streams running normally at a, at a time for three days. So huge volume. But you also you get you just get a discount. You're still paying conference fees. You're still paying travel fees to participate. So just consciously thinking about those opportunities where like those of you who are joining us at the Northwest Collaborative Futures Conference, you get to participate in everything for free. So there's there's um, there's different opportunities and different levels of opportunities in terms of, of what you want to do and how you want to engage with them. Um, I was going to I was going to say I recommend signing up for newsletters in different places. The only one I listed was mediate.com. And that's primarily because um, it is trying to become a resource for um, much more internationally. It has a, a US focus for sure, um, but it is increasingly trying to change that focus. And it's a very conscious move to do that. The people who um, run that organization are particularly focused on online dispute resolution. And so for them, this breaking down international borders is a really big move right now. So right now, I think you'll find it seeming extremely focused on the US and it is shifting. Sorry. I said, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to, so ju just continuing really quickly. Um, so look, at, look at the different groups you can join on social media, the different LinkedIn groups, have a, have a look at those and think about where you can connect. Um, the other thing I threw in there is think about the ways that you can be inviting the world to you. And I, I want to I wanna give kudos to Wangari actually for the ways in which she's bringing in international speakers for things. It is part of exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you can absolutely be doing that. But right now you have those opportunities. And if you're creating your own spaces and hangouts and, and events um, and sessions, it's really surprising how often people will simply say yes and join. Um, and, and yes, when Gary is very good at asking, um, but it's it's interesting because mediators, I, I think one of the skills of mediators is you're making asks all the time in mediation. You're asking people to um, to listen. You're asking people to think about things in different ways. Every time you're offering a reframe to something that they've said, you're you're making an offer to them. You're asking them to think about things differently. Um, and it, it is a skill set. And yet we often as mediators still hesitate about asking people to do things. Um, and it's it, it's interesting because I actually the very, very what well, I'm going to say the very, very best. It, I'm, I'm exaggerating an extraordinarily good way to make connections that are very positive um, has been demonstrated by a lot of different psychological studies to be asking a favor. People like you if you ask a favor. It feels like you're putting yourself out there and you're asking for something when what you're actually doing is building a relationship. You are giving them a chance to feel good about themselves and to feel supportive. And it is actually quite clearly demonstrated in a lot of the psychological literature that even asking to borrow a pen makes people feel slightly better about you if you're sitting beside them on the airplane. Um, it's very little things. Um, it took me a while. I wasn't I wasn't somebody who liked to ask favors, but I was running a bunch of programs where I needed a whole pile of volunteers. So, you know, you put out something in a newsletter and nobody answers you. So you have to start making phone calls. 
And it took me one round of trying to get 50 people to volunteer one night um, to realize that every single person I asked was happy to be asked. And not just that, but then they would invite me to things. They thought that we were much closer friends than I thought we had been previously. Like we de you develop relationships by making those asks. Think, be conscious that you can do that in terms of, of inviting the world to come to your events, to participate with you, to help you in the work that you're doing. Absolutely do that. And don't be shy. Um, I, well, Gary, I saw an email to Darcy asking for details on these things. I'll send, I'll, I'll drop these slides into the chat for you so you've got them, because those are the links. Um, unfortunately, I put in the time zone, I put in the time change, and I'm going to say those look about as appealing as uh, being invited to talk at 1 a.m. was for me today, because <laughs> all of the free events during the conference are not ideal timing, not ideal at all. But um, things like our opening speaker event with Tom O'Panikit, that will be recorded and available afterwards. Um, the film festival, um, some of the films might be accessible afterwards. And yeah, I think, and the careers, our careers panel in conflict resolution, um, and these are all things that are happening next week at the Northwest Collaborative Futures Conference, um, but are all free events, regardless of whether you're registered or not. The careers panel will definitely be recorded and posted. So while I'm sharing these links, um, I don't see it being super appealing for everybody here to be jumping on a 4 a.m. Zoom um, call unless you have really burning need to ask the questions in the moment. Um, we will definitely have those available and I'll make sure when Gary gets the, the links to be able to share with you um, for those different types of things. All right. Um, I'm going to just skip on past, actually, and I'm going to shut this down, Wangari, because I know I'm at the end of my time and I don't want to keep everybody. Um, but I do want to invite anyone to ask any questions or, or share any comments that they might have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharon, for uh, yeah, joining us through that um, topic. Um, uh, this being the impact weekend and the focus being on movement building and international internationalism. The rationale for the fellows is that is how can we stretch the work and uh, because it's, this is really about the work. Quite an interesting yeah. statement that you said is uh, build an awareness of mediation. It's not about marketing um, the services or self. And I really think that that would be quite an interesting um, uh, another talk just on its own, because yeah. as pro as yes, as professionals, just in our different fields, when uh, we do step out, we step out more speaking, uh, trying to cause attention to ourselves as the professional or the work it's, uh, or the work itself, and yet people do not yet have an appreciation of just how it serves them. So getting that language, and I think that's the opportunity for fellows now that we had the storytelling session and also critical thinking sessions, just tying in those um, together with what we have uh, been able to have today. So um, I, 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 if you may allow, allow me to uh, be able to just uh, run through uh, just a couple of comments that are in the, in, in the chat. Um, um, I know that we, we, yeah, we, we tackled the question with regard to the uh, taking on opportunities in the virtual space. And I believe that um, as, uh, because yes, and thank you for sharing the conflict resolution week sessions at Mediate BC. Uh, for us here in Kenya, we will actually be having a session um, on Thursday. So we will share that together on our conflict resolution as a day on Thursday. Uh, we will be able to share the, the, the details of the week at the conference. Um, that is running the Northwest Conference, then colleagues can be able to join in. And I believe just that the challenge for us as uh, mediators here in Kenya is, Dr. Sharon is speaking to us at 1 a.m. Um, in, uh, in Vancouver, and uh, it is now 12, um, it is now, uh, yes, 12 noon in Nairobi. She started off with us at midnight, and now it's actually 2 a.m., yeah? And uh, it's now 12 noon um, here in Nairobi there is no way we will be connecting with the international community if we are not choosing to be connecting and online at 2 a.m our time 4 a.m because we are in different time zones and this virtual space this being able to sit on these screens is what is bringing the connection 
So we encourage each other that uh, we can actually be able to connect on and get onto this, those sessions. Because yes, getting a session when it's live is very different from having to listen on to the recording also. Um, so we asked the question in terms of, uh, so what, what, what sessions or what uh, associations are you part of? So colleagues, it'd be interesting to hear which other associations you're part of. And uh, I see this is Caroline Nonjiko. Uh, if, you're, if you have interest in becoming part of international mediators, how and which ones are these international organizations that one can join in? Um, yeah, comments, uh, uh, Coach Maina Zimio, this session has been very insightful. Uh, then uh, Steve Mutembwa, Creating Friendships in Mediation, great presentation, Dr. Sharon. And uh, Kimani Gidongo is saying that, uh, yes, creating a niche in mediation, yes. Uh, that is actually a, 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 um, his takeaway today. And uh, I think there's something that you actually said with regard to what area is that that you can have credibility in. And that's the opportunity, fellows, with regard to the fellowship topic that you're working on. What is an area that you would want, uh, you have an idea in? Write about it and then you'll speak about it. And then you can actually develop further. And we have uh, persons like Dr. Sharon who are keen and willing. And uh, also we have our fellowship guide, uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Barrow, who are keen and willing to support us to be able to advance that message. I hope we notice the uh, mind map that Dr. Sharon presented. And that is just sitting down and being able to identify if you're talking about uh, the um, ability to now uh, develop a community of practice, then I mean, how can we think about it? So it's also the opportunity for us as fellows, the idea that you have, how can you mind map it? So that that becomes your framework. We keep calling it your Einstein. Uh, then, uh, yeah, Joyce King Ori, uh, very profound truths in regard to building awareness of mediation. Um, the question on what's my niche, where do I have credibility, and what communities do I belong, and how do they engage? I think that's also quite interesting with regard to taking us back. What communities do we belong to? Which county are you in? I mean, and how are we reaching out to that county, the church that you're in? Um, as part of, just as a reminder to the fellows, as part of the fellowship, we have the immersion challenge. And the immersion challenge is go to your chief and speak to them about mediation. Go to the local church and speak to now the pastor, the priests, and let them know about mediation. Simply that, that's just your immersion challenge. Then now from there, they will know that there are people um, known as um, mediators. So Dr. Sharon, we may kindly have your comment um, on any of the, uh, 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 the comments that have been given or the queries, and then we can be able to wrap um, the session. Dr. Sharon? Yeah, sure. I'm not really seeing a, a, a ton of questions, but I'm seeing some, some good observations. Um, the one question around if you have an interest in becoming an, um, part of international mediators, which organizations? Um, there, I, I would actually encourage you to um, either reach out um, directly to me to talk about your own area of practice, if, you, if that's something you're interested in, um, because I don't think there's a good answer that is for everybody. There are a lot of organizations that... Um, the, first of all, that you can only join if you're a lawyer, or there's a bigger focus on arbitration, or um, you'll pay a really large fee that doesn't, is not useful to you necessarily, depending on what your practice interest is. Um, so I think there's quite a few steps to think about which are the ones that would provide you um, the service that you need. Um, and I won't know all of them, but I do know quite a few different organizations, depending on what your special areas are or what your interests are. What would you want to get out of it? Um, but I, I really would um, hesitate to say that there's any single organization. Um, in fact, one of the things that is kind of odd about the way mediation works in particular is that me, while we talk about it as this wonderful collaborative um, world, many of the organizations are competitive and compete with each other and um, compete to establish priority um, in those different types of areas. So you do actually, they will advertise themselves in ways that make it seem like they are the most critical and most important organization in the world. But there isn't any overall world body that all mediators join. So definitely, um, it's definitely worth thinking about what do you want to do with mediation 
and then look at the organization that would suit you the best. Um, and there may be one or two, there might be more, but um, yeah, I, I really am. I'm quite happy to have that conversation, but there's no, for all of you, you should sign up for this. Um, and, and yeah, so, so when Gary, you wanted me to talk about um, mediators starting their own organizations. So, um, cause that is, that, that actually flows really nicely from what I'm saying, or mediators do have their own organizations in a variety of different places. Um, here, um, here, I was part of starting Mediate BC. Um, and that was, um, that was an organization that began because there was a very, very specific need to find a way to provide mentoring. Um, so mediators could actually get practice experience. And so we evolved around that. We reached out to all of the different stakeholders connected to the court at that particular time in order to set up something in court mediation. Um, but we were not the only organization that set up here. There's other ones that are running that are related specifically to family. Um, some of them are aim at credentialing and creating credibility for people who join, but other ones are really very much practice groups. They're there for very different kinds of reasons, and they evolve over time because they become um, they become larger and they evolve over time into something that actually provides a different kind of service. Um, an example I would give is we have. Um, what started as a really small group of people meeting for lunch once a month um, in New Westminster is a, is a town, um, the suburb of, of Vancouver. And so family mediators in that area started meeting for lunch monthly. Um, and they just wanted to talk about building practice. They just wanted to build community. But over time, they have developed a, a monthly meeting that actually brings in guest speakers that provides um, continuing professional development credit for mediators who are on rosters. Um, most of the members of, who started the organization were lawyers. That's expanded way beyond that. But for the lawyers, that, that participation actually counts towards their qualifications each year for continuing professional development. And they continue to expand and, and, and I cannot imagine doing family mediation in that area now without being a member of that organization. But they started just with a very much smaller process. Um, there are definitely, definitely places for mediation, mediation organizations, associations, um, communities of practice, different levels um, that are in particular for people who are not lawyers, I would say. Um, because there's often different kinds of communities that get structured that way. And it's one of the weird divisions that happens in mediation that doesn't need to happen, but shows up a lot. And I would um, definitely encourage you to be thinking about the ways in which the ways in which you can provide those organizations yourselves. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm hoping I'm addressing what you needed. Um, I do know we're kind of at the end of the of the time. So if there's any anything else, please know that you can reach out to me at any point. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharon. And uh, that becomes a very good uh, way to close on, on the session. It's been a, a wonderful impact weekend and uh, a very good coverage of uh, the movement building and uh, internationalism. So colleagues and friends, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Sharon and also uh, we also thank uh, Coach Maina Azimio, who has been, uh, who was our uh, uh, coach for the part one on, uh, on emotional uh, wellness today. And uh, we will be looking forward to the next session, which will be in the month of uh, November. And fiscally, it will be our graduation event for the fellows. And uh, with that, we will be able to uh, recite the words of the Kenyan National Anthem to be able to close this session and uh, we do wish everybody a very, uh, very uh, good day. And uh, we will recite the Kenyan National Anthem, the first stanza in English, O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation, justice be our shield and defender, may we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. 
This has been our fellowship weekend number four at the Fellowship National Certificate uh, um, going program for mediators. And this is the virtual personal development course. Our session today on the 16th day of the month of October in the year 2021. Asante Nisana and uh, God bless you. Thank you for being here.